Hello, everyone, and welcome to Police Off the Cuff, Real Crime Stories. This is our other show. It's called the Law and Crime Author Series. And I have an amazing, amazing guest on today. Yeah, there he is right there. I don't know if that's his favorite picture of himself. But it's Michael Vecchioni, a former Brooklyn District Attorney, Chief of the Homicide Bureau, Chief of the Rackets Bureau, mostly under Charles Hines. Uh, his career as a prosecutor spanned four decades. He co-authored four true crime books, Friends of the Family, Crooked Brooklyn, Behind the Murder Curtain, Homicide is My Business, and two true crime Kindle singles, Hand of the Kill and Murder on the Bridge. His latest book, Fallen Angel, a True Crime Fantasy, is his first novel. Not only does he have that background, but he's a, uh, a local boy, Hofstra University Law School. You know, I just had uh, a former FBI agent on that also went to Hofstra and was a Long Island boy. Uh, and it it's like, where am I getting all these Long Island people? And Bobby Chacon, a uh, great, uh, great FBI agent. And all these guys that go through their life and they just pop out a law degree. I'm always amazed at them. Without further ado, anyway, let me introduce to you Michael Vecchioni. Mike, welcome to the show. Thank you, Bill. Thanks for having me. It's good to see you again. Uh, and, you know, I got to tell you, I graduated from Hofstra because I was living out east at that point. Uh, but I'm a Brooklyn boy. You know that. I was born and raised in Brooklyn, went to college in Brooklyn, went to high school in Brooklyn, and and uh, and went to St. Teresa of Avila as my, uh, my elementary school. So uh, I became a Long Islander, so to speak, later in my years. And uh, but Hofstra was great. And uh, and I was I was in their first class, Bill. You realize that? It's uh, it's unbelievable. And uh, when I say that, I cringe because that makes me really old. Hofstra's well, been Mike, around do you for know a long that, time. Do you know now Hofstra just started a medical school? I did not know that. I didn't uh, know. Unbelievable. That, uh, yeah. I mean, yeah. you know, when you stay off Long Island for a while, I visited out east Stony Brook and Stony Brook is like gigantic. I was like, when oh, did yeah. this happen? You know? Yeah. 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 I had, I had three great years at, uh, at Hofstra and, um, and it, it's, it, that was my springboard to, um, you know, to the DA's office. I, um, I interned in the Brooklyn DA's office um, when I was in law school and, uh, and I fell in love. I fell in love with the work. I fell in love with the office and, um, and I knew what I wanted to be as soon as I, I, I began actually that internship. So, um, so Hofstra was good to me and, uh, and, and, and I've been back there. I, I used to teach there as well for a, a short period of time. I taught uh, trial advocacy at the law school and um, and it, it, I just, you know, I have nothing but good things to say about Hofstra. I, I'm, I'm very happy that I went there. So I was I was the only thing I was disappointed about with Hofstra and like every other politically correct school, they had to change their name from the Flying Dutchman, which they were yeah. when you were there to now. I think they called the Hofstra Pride. I sort of like that name. Yeah. I you know. know. I know. Well, my undergraduate school, St. John's University, did the same thing. They went from the Red Men to the Red Storm. You know, it was uh, yeah. the politically correct time. So, um, what are you going to do? Um, it, it it doesn't detract from uh, from the quality of the school, that's for sure. And um, and once again, I, I as far as St. John's was concerned, I, I I loved the four years I spent at St. John's. I, I I was in a fraternity there, and and I ultimately went back to teach at St. John's law school as well. And, um, so, so I've got, um, I've got really, uh, nothing but good things to say about both St. John's and Hofstra. That's tremendous. Mike, let's get to what we're going to talk about today. You've okay. become like a, a writer of note and I'm surprised nothing has hit the, uh, the silver screen based on all your stories. I put this little flyer up there, uh, and it's sort of a collage of some of your books. Homicide is my business. Crooked Brooklyn. Friends of the family with a good buddy of ours, uh, Tommy Dades, a great uh, first grade detective. Uh, and I mean, you're, you're a busy guy. And, you know, something people would ask, where does all that inspiration come from? And the stories that you've collected and are able to tell now were part of your legal career at the Brooklyn DA's office. Exactly. All of them. All of them. I uh, Except for homicide. I'm sorry. Except for behind the murder curtain. All of the books were um, were about things that I was involved in personally, cases that I've handled personally, uh, trials that I conducted myself, and um, and and um, it was a you know a wealth of information and a wealth of experience that I now share with people because um, 
I think it's, you know, I had a story to tell. And, and I think that the, the cases were, um, were worthy of, uh, of publishing. And, uh, and I'm happy that I was able to find a couple of publishers who were interested in putting our books, to, putting our books on the market. And, um, and as far as Hollywood is concerned, Bill, I got to tell you that right now I have two, two books, Friends of the Family, as well as Fallen Angel, optioned by Hollywood people. And of course, when do you think we option them? Just before the, the strike. The writer's strike. The writer's <laughs> strike. So now they're sitting in limbo out in uh, out in California, waiting for the uh, the writer's strike to be um, you know to be settled. Hopefully soon. In fact, Fallen Angel, there's a pilot already written. The um, the, the we, we have a writer attached. There was a big time writer, and we wrote a pilot, and um, and it's all ready to go and to take it out into the marketplace, and uh, and then the strike hit. So. Um, so maybe maybe one of these days you'll have me on when the show premieres on television and we can talk about that as well. 100 percent. So, you know, Mike, since you started out and I was going to start with the most recent and go backwards. But sure. since you mentioned Friends of the Family, why don't we start there? Because this sure. is an unbelievably fabulous, story, almost a story that you can't believe is real. You well, know, absolutely. It's, it's, it's that, you know, two cops, uh, Ippolito and Caracappa. You know, they go through their career and unbelievable corruption. Like the people say, oh, the greatest corruption that ever happened was during Frank Serpico's time. How about this? Two NYPD yeah. detectives that were committing murders for the mob. How about right. that as one of the most corrupt acts in the history of the NYPD? Well, when when we when we uh, had the press conference um, in the DA's office, uh, it's a long story about why we did it the way we did it um, in terms of announcing it. Uh, the district attorney uh, did say exactly that, that this was the most uh, heinous case of corruption uh, in the history of the New York City Police Department. And, and I happen to agree with him. Um, and you're correct, Bill. They were they were on the mob payroll and they were killing people uh, on behalf of the mob themselves, pulling the trigger themselves. As well as tipping off um, the the at that point underboss of the uh, Lucchese crime family, uh, Gas Pipe Casso, uh, to informants who were testifying on behalf of uh, the government against uh, against him, and um, or were lined up to testify against him, and he was he was um, he got the the mafia cops as they are uh, known um, because one of them wrote a book called Mafia Cop uh, were, were doing the hits. And um, and if they weren't actually doing the hits, they were picking up the people who were supposed to be hit and bringing them to a guy like Casso, who would then do the hit. So um, it was it was horrendous. I mean, it was horrendous. You know, I got to tell you, Bill, before I, I in between my stints in the DA's office, I, uh, I did a, a two year stint at the police department. I actually was an assistant commissioner and I was in charge of the advocate's office, which is the the disciplinary system of the uh, of the police department, and um, and I got to know because I worked with internal affairs and 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 uh, and at that time the field internal affairs units, and I got to know about Epolito. Um, he wasn't he wasn't a stranger to me when we began the investigation in the Brooklyn DA's office. It seemed as if from the time that he wrote his book called Mafia Cop, that he put a target on his back um, and he beat a case in the trial room um, that involved him turning documents over to wise guys. And, and he was he was practicing and uh, practicing to be <laughs> what he ultimately became. And that is a, a very, very dirty cop. Um, and I got to tell you one other little thing that was uh, that's really uh, not too many people know this. I grew up in Brooklyn, as I told you, and my my mom and my aunt were members of a group that um, that worked with a, a an order of nuns. And, um, and they were, they, it was like the Rosary Society, except it was centered on this particular order of nuns that, that were in our parish. And one of the ladies who was, in, who was part of that, who became one of their best friends, was a, a, la a lady by the name of Ray Ippolito, I-P-P-O-L-I-T-O. -P -P but I always remember that my mother and my aunt used to talk about um, her husband, and um, and and how her husband's family had these shady connections in the mob and and 
that they were, um, you know, that they were that they were wise guys in her family. And it turns out, as I got into the case and learned all about Louis Eppolito, he had a third. He had his, he had a third uncle. His his father. I'm sorry, a, a second uncle. He had his father was in the mob. An uncle was in the mob, both with the name Eppolito. And then there was a third party, uh, another uncle, who was so who was different from them and who changed his name to Ippolito. And believe it or not, Bill, it turns out that that's the guy that my parents, my mother and my aunt knew his wife. And um, and I grew up with it with his son. Um, so it became something that, you know, it was it was really unbelievable to me when I first got into this and started to do the background um, that that. I had that kind of a connection to to a guy who I would later investigate for the types of murders that this guy was doing. Um, the book became a um, became something that was a quite frankly a labor of love for both Tommy Tommy Dades, who I I got to know very very well when when I was a DA and he was a detective. He 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 always told me that he was the guy he was kind of my DA my detective when he had a case that. Um, he needed somebody to handle specifically. Well, he came to me and we did a lot of cases before he brought the, uh, you know, the mafia cops to me. And um, so so we it was it was terrific for us. We were able to, you know, to make headway into something that the federal government had been sitting on for well, well over 10 years. And, um, you know, and Mike, could I, Mike, could, yeah, could sure. I interrupt you for one second? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's yeah. one of the parts that I want to just explore a little bit. Sure. When sure. you have two guys that dirty, Ippolito and Caracappa, doing hits for the NYPD, it seemed like the powers that be were like, get them out of here. That was sort of like the philosophy make it go away, let them retire, get them out of here. Because it's such a black eye on the NYPD, and they actually were able to retire move to Las Vegas and start committing crimes in Las Vegas until you guys eventually caught up to them and they got arrested. I mean, it was like almost as if the, you know, when you talk about the ineptitude of the NYPD internal affairs division, uh, that was the reputation, at least back then that they didn't want to lay a glove on real Michael Dowd, another case, the real serious corruption. It seemed like they had no clue how to go after it. And here's two guys doing hits for the mafia. And they, no one laid a glove on these guys. Well, there, you know, Bill, there's another aspect, and you're correct. You're 100 percent correct about the uh, internal affairs and 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 their ineptitude, so to speak, or just basically putting you know bl a blinder on at that point and not doing anything. But there's one other aspect to it that is that's interesting, and that is that the feds had um, had had turned Gas Pipe Casso. He became an informant for the feds, and. Um, and they had in, they interviewed him, and um, you know there has to be hundreds of of what they call 302s, which are reports of the of the debriefings of Casso, and uh, and in those reports, and I've read them, I've read them, I, I, I remember getting them and reading them, and he names he doesn't name them by he doesn't give their names at and Caracappa, but he talks about having two cops on his payroll. And um, at, at that point, having had two cops on his payroll because he had been arrested, uh, he called them his crystal ball. And what he used to do, which was perfect, he would get information that that he needed to have handled and he would give it to them or he would ask them for information and uh, they would get back to him with it. And then he would take action most of the time, killing whoever it is they get they fingered. Um, the Fed sat on it for this for 10 years as well. And the reason is because the the of gas of gas pipe gas pipe had had written lots of letters to the US attorney's office and to the court during John Gotti's trial the one that he ultimately was convicted on and he said that Salvatore Gravano was a was a liar Gravano was the main witness of the case and he put down Gravano they were afraid the feds were afraid to give any credence to what Casso was saying about the mafia cops because they felt that that would give credence in some way to to Gotti's lawyers to overturn the Gotti conviction. Because if 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 for instance, if we believed, if they the feds believed uh, Casso with regard to the mafia cops, well then he must be telling the truth with regard to to Gotti and 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 Gravano, and that's why they did nothing. They sat on it until we got the information, and I sent Tommy over to the U.S. Attorney's Office. 
to get their boxes. He brought back 10 boxes of, of files, Bill, and sat in our office, the DA's office, going through them until we had this one breakthrough, which was a, a, um, a computer printout uh, that actually Kara Kappa um, was the author of, or a, a report, I should say, he was the author of, and he was looking for one of the people that was involved in, in the hit on Gas Pipe Casso. And, and Casso hired these two guys, the two mafia cops, to find the people who had tried to kill him. And, um, and that, that, that printout gave us the, the information we needed and, and corroborated what we thought all along was that these two guys were bad. How did it corroborate? Very simply. He had searched the name, Nicky Guido. Nicky Guido was supposed to be a guy in the car who was who was who shot at Casso. And by the way, they missed him. And he and 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 Cara Kappa found a, a Nicky Guido who lived in South Brooklyn and um, and was kind of this, around the same age as the as the as the wise guy Nicky Guido. And uh, he got his address and he turned it over to to Gaspipe. And Gaspipe gave it to two hitters. And on Christmas morning one uh, uh, one year, and I forget the year. The hitters rolled up on that street. Nicky Guido, the wrong Nicky Guido, the kid who was an innocent person, was showing his brand new car to his uncle on the street. And these two guys walked up, uh, drove up and opened fire and killed Nicky Guido. He actually jumped on his uncle to protect his uncle, and he died as a result of the gunshot wounds. Turns out it was the wrong guy. The real Nicky Guido had taken off out of New York once he heard that they were after him and he went to California where, where he was ultimately found. Um, so, so that's the kind of thing that these guys were responsible for this. They were directly responsible for a, a, a young kid, innocent kid who worked for the telephone company to be murdered on the street. So um, that was the break that we were able to get. And, um, and, and that's a result of us being d diligent and going through the files that the feds were sitting on for 10 years. So, um, you, you know, know, Mike, when I, when I hear that and you hear what not just what these guys were willing to do, uh, and I don't know how much money they were getting, no amount of money would be worth selling your, your badge like that, selling, not just your badge, your soul. And the fact that they were killing people and then right. result gave information that resulted in the wrong person getting killed. I mean, right. these guys were as low as you could be the lowest that, of the that, low. And they happened to have... NYPD detective shields around their neck. Without a doubt. Without a doubt. You know, they were getting, I can give you the answer. The answer was they were make they were on retainer between four and six thousand dollars a month. That was when they that was just being available to gas pipe. When they asked them to do some business, meaning killing somebody, um, it was they got more money for that. So so that's what they basically sold their uh, their souls for. And now both of them are probably doing the devil's work in hell right now. So, um, you know, the, uh, <laughs> they're still working. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they, they found the home, believe it or not. So, um, so that, that was, you know, it was the, I, that whole story, uh, Bill, when we, when we finally, when it finally was brought to an end, um, when Tommy and I decided to do this book, we put it out, we had a, an agent and, uh, and he put, he put it up for auction. Who was going to give us, you know, the the the, the biggest and the the, the largest uh, advance? And um, and I went out with the agent and um, and the and the other writer who was with us, uh, David Fisher. I went out and pitched this, you know, pitched it to various uh, places, and um, and we were able to, you know, we we had more than you could possibly imagine people interested in this, and we sold, we optioned the book. Uh, to Warner Brothers. Warner Brothers actually bought it. They were the first ones. And we, we sold it four times after that. And, uh, and now just before this strike, as I mentioned before, it was optioned again. Um, and this time, I believe, well, I better not say anything because I don't want to jinx myself and say no, that. Isn't that, isn't that the truth? You got to keep yeah, your mouth shut till it. it happens. You yeah, know? yeah, yeah, yeah. So so that was, um, you know, it was a really eye-opening experience for all of us because it was our first, ex when I say us, I'm talking about Tommy and I, um, for for us in terms of Hollywood and, and writing books and publishing and things of that nature. And, um, 
And you know, Bill, in some respects, is as cutthroat a business as any anyone you're anyone you're ever going to get involved. More so, you know, Mike. One of the things with people in Hollywood and people that do even podcasts, everyone wants to pick your brain. And when you say, "Whoa, whoa, whoa, hold on a second, how much am I getting paid for this?" Oh, oh, oh you want money? All of a yeah, sudden, yeah, they're yeah. like shocked. Like they think they can use ex cops, ex district attorneys. Let me talk to you for four hours and just pick what you have inside you. And I always stop them and because I've been taken over the calls numerous times. Don't me get too. me wrong. And uh, now I always say, whoa, 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 how much am I getting paid? For? Oh, you want money? They can't, they actually are shocked that you asked for money. Dude, I've been down that road before. And unless I get, you know, I get this amount an hour just to talk to me, or I'm not interested, you know. And it Absolutely. sounds callous, and people go, oh, that's ridiculous. No, it's not. These people are cutthroat, and they're making money off your stories. Exactly. Exactly. I do the same thing, Bill. I, I stopped doing this. I, I did one recently, and I did it for, for a case that was near and dear to my heart, um, the case involving a, a judge in Brooklyn that became basically the centerpiece of Crooked Brooklyn, The other, the other, not the next book, but the, the book that we, uh, yeah, it was the, the book that I did after Friends of the Family. And uh, and they were doing it. It was just on TV. It was called Mother Undercover. And it was a story of four mothers, different, obviously different cases, uh, who uh, basically went undercover to to do something to save or to make sure that their children weren't taken away from them. And and the case that I did with the uh, Gerald Garson was the judge who, who was uh, in divorce court in Brooklyn and was looking to take this woman's uh, children away from her. And she came to us. And we opened up an investigation and sent her basically undercover to talk to a guy who said that he could fix the case for her. And um, but that so that one I did without asking for any money because I, I couldn't. She was it, it. She it was just not not in my opinion not the right thing to do. But other people have come to me and and I've had to say, listen, I'm not doing this unless you pay me. And I'm not, you know, Bill, I'm sure you don't ask for a million dollars either. You know, no, just no. Big, give me something that's going to recognize that I right, show me good faith. Buy me a, a, a veal parmesan hero. You yeah. know? <laughs> <laughs> show me good faith, you know, there like, you go. like time so that, is worth that, something, you know? Yeah. Look, it was, it, and I know that you, you're referring to homicide as my business. The guy that was the centerpiece of that and informant of mine he came into my office and I said to him, you're hungry? He said, yeah. And and I, what do you want? He wanted a veal parmesan hero <laughs> and a beer. And and Bill, I got it for him. And we, we every time he came in and I had, I was with the guy for months. And every time he came in, I gave him the veal parmesan and a, and a beer. And, and he was, uh, he told me everything that he knew. So, um, you know, Mike, they, we, we had a guy once uh, confess to a double murder and the price was, a large pepperoni pizza and two packs of Newports. Yeah. And I flew out. To, they were in Willimantic, Connecticut. I flew out, bought the pizza and the and the cigarettes, and he confessed 10 pages of confession to this double murder. There you go. There you go. There you go. Well, you know, Luigi, who was the centerpiece of that homicide as my business, um, gave me information that I also turned over later on to uh, turned him over to, to the feds. And he wound up um, testifying at, at the trial involving the Pizza Connection, which was a, uh, you know, a, a big mafia drug operation that, that took the place of the French Connection, which he was involved in as well. So um, and, and interestingly enough, when he went to testify for um, in the Pizza Connection, the prosecutor was Louis Free, who became the head of the FBI and Rudy Giuliani, who you might have heard of. Um, and they both used uh, Luigi as witnesses in the in the pizza connection case. But I had him first. You know, I had him first. And he he gave me everything that that I needed, um, solved some cases for us in Brooklyn and um, and then went on to become the star of that book. Unfortunately, no longer around. He killed himself in uh, while he was in witness protection, of all things, because he he could he couldn't live. He couldn't stand being in that kind of a life, you know, he just, he couldn't stand it. He was alone. He was not making enough money. He was not used to, you know, living a regular life. If you're a hitman, which he was in Sicily, as well as a hitman in Brooklyn, um, you know, asking, being asked to, uh, to live the life of a, a, of a middle-class American in the Midwest somewhere, wherever he was being held in witness protection just didn't work for him. So, um, so he, he, he killed himself, which is unfortunate, but, um, 
the but it was a uh, it was a very eye opening experience for me uh, when I when I had this guy and um, and you know Bill I got to tell you except for the fact other than the, I'm sorry except for the fact that I, my if it, if my my name wasn't what it was and didn't end in a vowel which is obviously his name ended in a vowel I wouldn't have gotten this case my boss in the homicide bureau at the time when this guy walked in with the two detectives from from Brooklyn uh, South Homicide. He said, they said, he's, he's got a lot of information. You know, the cops didn't want him anymore. They got whatever they needed to get out of him and uh, turned them over to us. Uh, and my boss said, he's yours. He's Italian. You're Italian. So, you know, you're, uh, you're in. And, and it, it actually worked out very well because we, we hit it off. I have to say, <laughs> and I keep hey, saying that, that, and, that Paisan stuff works, you know, <laughs> exactly, exactly. But, but if my, if my, my mother and father, my grandmother and grandfather was still alive. And I told them that I had become, had some sort of a relationship with some Italian hitman or Sicilian hitman. They would have, they would, they would have dropped dead in their, in their tracks right then. But, um, but it turned out to be important that I had the background that I did because he felt comfortable with me and, um, and, and it worked out very well. And, uh, and the book is, you know, I, I'm hoping to, to at some point option the book too. That's another, another almost, uh, I don't want to say a, um, uh, a victim of the strike, but, um, but the agent that I have out in Hollywood is basically about to, I sent them the, the book proposal and he read the book and he was about to take it out into the, again, into the marketplace to get an option at least. I haven't even optioned it yet. And, uh, and then of course the strike hit. So. Um, I know it sounds like I'm, I'm crying in my beer here, but no, uh, but you know, I guess hey, Mike, I am. <laughs> things, things take time, you know, things yeah. take a lot. Of, sometimes, you know, there's stops and starts and then you, it's a go and then it's not a go. That's the nature of that business. And, yeah, you know, you absolutely. have to understand that that even happens to big time actors. Oh, this movie's going in September. Oh, we're going to put it off till January. Oh, it's not going till next. You know, it's uh, so it happens even to them. I see that, but yeah. look, you're in the right place. And you know, the, that book, Friends of the family, to me, that is like the one of the greatest stories oh, that I've terrific. heard in a long time. You know, it's terrific. It, it's a great story, and and we knew it as soon as we, you know, we had the we we were able to, you know, to get in and to break into it. And um, and as I said, so did the people who, um, you know, who we were involved with in terms of trying to sell the story. They loved it. We had we basically had to turn people away who wanted to represent us to you know, to sell that story at that time. And um, we sold it rather easily and uh, and then did the book and uh, and then sold the movie rights very easily, you know? So, um, it, it, you know, it, it was just, I guess, again, a victim of circumstance at that point. Um, Warner Brothers optioned it. They were the first ones. And they I had to actually talked to the executives at Warner Brothers. They had been talking to me about how the movie would open and what their vision was of, of, of it close, uh, how the, how it would end, you know? Um, and as you know, from reading it, what happened is the feds essentially stole the case from us when we made it, they didn't want it for 10 years. When Tommy and I made it uh, along with Joe Ponzi, who was, who, who was able to turn the most important witness that we had in our favor, um, they then stole it from us. And, um, and it's a, it's a, um, it's a hurt that will never go away, Bill. I got to tell you, because um, that case was I, I had already figured out in my head how I was going to try the case. And um, and then when I couldn't do it, it was like, you know, someone had, uh, you know, had, had destroyed all of my presence on Christmas morning. You know, that kind wow. of thing. So, yeah. um, but uh, but, you know, it'll be it, I think that the people who now have it in their hands, these guys. One of them was the head, believe it or not, this is another ironic thing. A person attached to it now was the former head of uh, Warner Brothers Studios. Not back then, but since then, he became the head of Warner Brothers. He has since been, been um, I don't want to say put out the pasture, but he, he, he's been replaced by someone else. And they gave him the position of now the head of Warner's television. So, um, so it's perfect for us because we've always envisioned this as being, um, now anyway, we've envisioned this as being a, a six or eight part series for, you know, Netflix or one of these streaming services. And, um, and, and it's, uh, to tell you the truth, I think it's in the best hands that it's ever been in right now. 
And if this damn strike would, would get settled, we'd be able to move on and, and get it done. You know, so, you know, Mike, it's unbelievable how the vision of uh, a great story like this, you can either look at it as a hour and 45 minute or two hour movie, or it's such a great story that you could look at it at a six or eight part series, like on a yeah. Netflix thing. And it changes the whole complexity Oh, of the story no and everything, because now you got more time to tell the story. You got more characters you can put in, more people you can cast, more people are going to get a job from this. But it it does change the complexion of the whole story. It does. It does. And you know what else has happened since the first time we sold it? Um, we've gotten more information about these guys, about Epolito and Caracappa, other incidents, other cases. And now we're able to to draw on the people who gave us that information and make this an even bigger story than it was before. So, so it, it'll be, I, I'm looking forward to it. I, I think it'll be a really very good, uh, good series if it gets to be made. And um, you know, it's it, it, but we just have to wait, just have to wait. Hey, we, I, the book we did after that, I did after that Jerry with Jerry Schmetter, who is, was my writing partner, who's no longer with us, unfortunately. Um, he, uh, we did Crooked Brooklyn, and that's another one. That that book is is a story of, of essentially eight years of my life in the as chief of rackets, um, doing one corruption investigation after another, and, um, and and in that, at the end of those seven or eight years, I had convicted three Supreme Court judges, Brooklyn Supreme Court judges, two of whom went to jail and did time. Uh, convicted the head of the Democratic Party, who was the number uh, in Brooklyn, who was the number three person in the New York State Assembly, a guy named Clarence Norman. I convicted and he went to jail. I convicted him three times. He went to jail. That led us to, um, well, actually, the judge, a judge led us, a corrupt judge led us to the Clarence Norman thing. The judge, uh, one of the three judges that I convicted, went to jail. Um, and, and then an assembly woman, we, 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 were, we were doing this on a regular basis, one after the other after the other, that the Department of Investigation, the city, New York City Department of Investigation, which investigates employees of the city, came to us and said, we believe we have an assembly woman who has bribed a co contractor in Brooklyn to build her. He, she would, she would <laughs> sign off on a tract of land that he wanted to purchase to build homes. But she only would do it if he would make sure that one of the homes that that he built was given to her, given to her, Bill, not not sold <laughs> to her, given to her. You got to love government. <laughs> right. And she and wait a second. And, and to cover that, she said, you can give me a mortgage, but I'm not going to pay one cent on the mortgage. And then after a year or two, you'll forgive the mortgage and that'll be the end of it. And the house will be mine free and clear. We got that as a result of doing the other corruption investigations. So when D.A. Hines lost his last election and, and I had to retire and Jerry had to retire, Jerry Schmetterer, we said, Mike, he said to me, Mike, we, we have to do this. We have to do a book. I mean, you've spent basically eight years of your life doing this one after the other after the other. And I tried almost all of the cases myself, investigated and tried them. And mm -hmm. that was that was Crooked Brooklyn. Um, and, and we topped it off with. The story, you know, you talk about in unbelievable stories, Bill. We topped it off. The last chapter is a story of a guy, a dentist, who was a um, who was a, a very prominent dental surgeon uh, who worked in Manhattan, lived in Fort Lee, New Jersey, and um, and he was addicted to Demerol and ultimately wound up losing his license. He was a, a surgeon who knew how to put implant, did a lot of implantation, and and as a result, he knew the. The, the how precious uh, getting his hands on bone and tissue are because he would use them in his uh, in his in his practice. But there was short supply. So um, he he tried to establish a business where he would uh, he would harvest legally from cadavers and from people who had uh, died of, of various um, uh, diseases. He would try to harvest those bone and tissue and sell it to these processing companies who doctors would then purchase uh, the pieces from to use for their patients. He wasn't making, he wasn't getting very far because when he would approach the family and asked, can I essentially, your, your loved one just died. Can I have at that body and take all of the bone and tissue out of the body and sell it? They would, they told him basically get lost, you know, <laughs> go, 
Are you kidding me? So you know what yeah. he did? He said, okay. He cut deals with the with funeral directors and said, you let me know before you finish with the body that he's that a body is there. I will come with my people, clear the whole body out of what I need to clear it out. And I'll give you a piece of, uh, of what I get from selling the bone and tissue. The problem was, Bill, he didn't care what the person died of. So he was harvesting bone and tissue from people who died of communicable diseases. Oh, God. Who died of things like HIV, who, who died of, of, of stuff that, you know, you would certainly not want a piece of that body in, in your body. Um, and the other part is he would also harvest bones of people who were 80, 90, and above, and and then process, send them to the processing company, and the processing company would not know the age because what he was doing is he was forging the paperwork that went along with what he sold to the processing company. And one of the people that he he did this to, one of the 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 uh, bodies that he did this to was Alice the Cook, who was the 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 host of uh, I think it's Masterpiece Theater. Yeah, and. Um, and we knew that because we, we were able to get all of his um, his paperwork. And uh, and we went to his daughter and said, did you give permission to have your father's bone and tissue taken? And she said, I don't know what you're talking about. Of course, I didn't. And uh, then we told her what was what we had. She told me that her her father was cremated. And she said, you know, when I spread his ashes the way he where he wanted me to spread them, I noticed that there, they were like talcum powder. There was no little bits and pieces of bone or anything in there. And I always wondered what that was about. Well, what it was about is that these guys had at that body cleared all the bone and tissue out. And then it was cremated. So it turned out to be, like she said, talcum powder. Um, he, he, was, he was horrific. And we were able to get that case um, in the midst of this eight year time when I was doing one corruption case after the other. And I, and then we had this and it became one of the biggest stories that I had ever been involved in cases ever been involved in, in my career. And, um, and, and we, we, we topped off crooked Brooklyn with, with that story. And, um, to this day, I'm, I talk about that case because people are so interested in, and, and I'm surprised the only thing that surprises me is not that they are interested, but that there are enough people who don't even know about the case. And it was at the time of one of the biggest stories in in New York City. It was um, it was just it was unbelievable. But um, Mike, do you, do you just think that this is still going on? Even maybe even in a bigger way, where they're selling body parts? Yes, yes, you know, I do. lungs, uh, hearts, uh, all kinds of things now because yes. with human trafficking and and you know the criminal element involved. This this sounds like uh, it's ripe for a a, a a fresh story about this, so that it could still be happening, without a doubt. There was a recent one involving, I think it was either UCLA or USC Medical School, who was um, they were wound up selling bodies that were um, uh, either buy, they were either buying or selling. I think they were selling bodies that they had they had purchased legitimately, and and there are families that that will do this. You know, there are families who. Their, their loved ones agree to have, uh, you know, their organs donated and and to science and things of that nature. Um, but they were selling these bodies illegally to to these two guys. And I forgot what the purpose of what these two guys wanted it for, wanted the bodies for. But that was the most recent one that I have heard of. Um, there are other stories like this, and there have been other stories since um, since we did the um, the guy's name was Michael Mastro Marino, by the way, the the, the dentist, uh, since we did the Mastro Marino case. And, um, uh, so, so it is, it's, it's not something that we put to bed, so to speak, because we exposed this guy. It didn't, that didn't happen. There's too much money to be made though. You know, there's too much money to be made. You know what? I got to tell you, I got to tell your listeners this Mastro Marino, um, ultimately pled guilty. And, and I have done a lot of trials built in my life, a lot of cases, and I never saw the interest from family members uh, in, in, in any of the other trials, as much as I saw the interest in the family members at this trial, the courtroom would be packed every time the case was on the calendar for nothing other than maybe a legal motion. And at the end of the day, when the, he finally pled guilty and the families were given the opportunity to make a statement to the judge, 
we had a line out the door of, of people wanting to speak. And he ultimately was sentenced to 54 years in prison, which was a pretty good wow. rap for, yeah. yeah, 54 years. But you know what happened? <laughs> Several years into his prison term, he died in prison. You know what he died of? Bone cancer. Oh, my so God. When you How talk ironic, about right? karma being a bitch, man, that is <laughs> that's unbelievable. When I, I'll, I'll never forget the day that somebody walked into my office and said, Mike, Master Marino died. And I said, oh, what happened? And I thought he got killed in prison, quite frankly, right. because he was the kind of guy who people would not like, I think. And 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 that's what I thought. And they said, no, 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 no. he died of bone cancer. So. Uh, it was, uh, it, it's the, you know, karma and, and, the, you know, you know, Mike, as a writer, could you even make up a character like Michael Master Marino or, or because that old expression, truth is much stranger than fiction is always the truth. That's correct, Bill. That's correct. And, and the answer to your question, the short answer is no, I couldn't. And, and, you know, and, and, and the idea that he was doing it, locally here in Brooklyn uh, with us um, kind of was mind boggling to me that that we would have such a big, a big operation, a big case like that uh, of that nature. You know, that's the kind of thing you see somewhere else in the world or, or someplace else in the United States. I didn't think that it would happen in Brooklyn. But when we looked into the cases that he did from Brooklyn, um, we found we uncovered eleven hundred cases um of his that were just brooklyn cases then we went we branched out he had he had done things in in manhattan he had done things in rochester new york he had done the same thing in philadelphia he had set up a deal with a prison in russia that when a russian prisoner died he was going to have the body at he was going to have access to the body before they turned it over to the family or before it was buried and they were going to, he was going to take the, the, the body from Ru the Russian prison to Germany where he had a, a setup. So he would then do the whole thing that he, that he did in the Brooklyn uh, funeral homes. And, you know, some people also say to me, well, you know, how come people didn't recognize that there, if there was no bone in their, in their loved one's body and they were laid out at a wake. Why wouldn't a family say something? Well, point they didn't know because what they, what his people did was when they took out a bone, they would replace it with a plastic pipe, PVC pipe. So wow. when we when we found out about this, what we did was we exhumed 10 bodies because that was going to be the coup de grace on the case. If 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 what our information, if our information was correct and, and there were there was PVC pipe in these bodies, then we wanted to know that. So we exhumed 10 bodies, took them to the medical examiner's office. And in Crooked Brooklyn, in the book, I have photographs of the press conference where we display the x-rays of various body parts in these bodies with PVC pipe being the uh, in place of the bones. In one instance, Bill, it almost looked like a Frankenstein situation because at the end of one of the leg bones, well, the, bone, the pipe that was supposed to be a leg bone, in order to attach, to reattach the foot, the foot bone, they had put a bolt through it and the bolt and the nut were uh, were seen in the uh, in the in the the the, the x-ray um so <laughs> it was um it was it was one of the best attended press conferences that I that we ever had in the Brooklyn DA's office while I was there it was worldwide news at that point there were there were there were uh news agencies from Europe and Asia who were at the press conference we had no room we had a we had to, to open up another room and have a TV camera in there, a TV uh, a monitor, so that they could watch the press conference. That's how how big it was. And you know, um, Mike, but for him to do that, he had to have a network of other criminals. Oh, that sure. Enabled him to oh. do that to, you know, get rid of the bone, to sell the bone to uh, dishonest doctors. Right? There had to be a whole network of this. Well, here's what he did. He he had people working for him. These guys that were cutters, as he called them. And um, and he had he had obviously other people that he trained. He trained several people in Philadelphia, some people in Rochester to do what he was doing because he couldn't be in every place at every at all the times. But the and then he had he had the the crooked um, funeral directors who were on the take. So they were all um, they were all several of them we arrested and they were arrested in other parts of the country. Um, 
But in terms of the, the processing companies, as they were called, the place where the bones were ultimately sent for processing to be then sold to doctors, they, were, they, they claimed that they knew nothing about the origin of the bone and that they were receiving. And I have to say that it would have been very difficult for me to prove otherwise because he, Mastro Marino forged death certificates, first of all. So if you died, let's say, of a communicable disease, obviously a processing company would not take that bone because it just was ridiculous. No doctor right, would, would right. take it. So what he did was he changed the death he, 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 he threw away the true death certificate, forged the new one, and you became uh, a victim of a car accident. That's, that's how he would do it. Or some other, uh, you know, uh, uh, some other death that didn't in, involve the, the uh, disease that was in you, that you died from. So that's, that's one. The second thing is he had a form that was a, a, um, a, a, an authorization form that he, that he had the family, he presented to a family, so to speak, uh, and the family gave him permission to take the bone. Well, all of that was total forgery. When we walked up to a, a we went, our detectives walked into a home asking the family, did you sign this piece of paper and, and give permission? One of them looked at the detective and said, there's nobody by that name in my family. They used the last name and they took a first name and they made it. They said, we don't have anybody in our family by that name. And I would never give them permission to do that. So he had a forged death certificate, a forged authorization. And the last thing was, along with the bone or tissue, whatever it was he was, he was selling, he had to have, he, the uh, processing companies required a vial of blood from the body so that they could test it to make sure that it didn't have any disease, that the body didn't die of disease. You know what he did? He had a bag, and we found this bag in his garage in a, in a, uh, uh, a cooler, like a, a freezer that you would see in a supermarket. Uh -huh. He had a bag of what he called clean blood. He had vials of blood that he would take from various bodies with this, with the help of these funeral directors that didn't die of communicable diseases. And he would just take a vial, make a note on it, put it, slap it on the vial and send that vial down along with the two forged documents. So the processing companies said to us and said to the feds later on, what were we supposed to do? How were we to know that something uh, was, was taken improperly or that someone was that a bone was taken from somebody who had HIV or, or, or hepatitis or something of that nature. It, it's hard to argue against that, Bill. I, I don't know how we would have ever proved uh, that they were responsible as well. Or it, it, seems, it, se say. it seems like it's an unregulated industry. It that, was at uh, that time. It was. Yeah. It was. You know, we our case resulted in a nationwide recall of bones, believe it or not. And what it sounds crazy. But what the FDA did is they put out a recall of anyone whose doctor or to any doctor who had purchased bone from these particular companies that Mastro Marino sold his bones to. And they they were required to contact their patients to bring them in to examine them. And many of the patients um, were were under the or stuck with the idea of having to be examined on a regular basis for the for the rest of their lives because of this because the disease that might have been in their bone or might have been in the the, the cadaver's bone may have ultimately awakened so to speak in the in the place where it was transplanted so um it was as i said before bill was, i've done a lot of cases and i've done a lot of that's, crazy an, that's an amazing that's an amazing this one I mean. this one took the cake for me it took the cake and you know bill what i'm, I'm thinking of doing is is taking that last chapter of, of Crooked Brooklyn and expanding it and writing an entire book about Mastro Marino because there's a lot more that I couldn't fit the whole case in you know in one chapter. But Jerry and I both said we can't finish this book off without at least mentioning this case and putting it in because it was part of that that eight year period that I, I did nothing except these cases, you know. So um you know, Mike, so we'll we're at, we have about, you know, we're almost at five, five, zero minutes and you didn't touch upon your most recent book. OK, uh, I will. Fallen Angel. And, and I want you to get that in because this would probably this book. And of course, 
uh, Homicide is My Business, folks. These are all available on Amazon, uh, as well as Friends of the Family. And uh, we, we mentioned Crooked Brooklyn. But I just, again, wanted you to get a chance to speak about this book before we reach, uh, you know, so an hour. I will do that. So the, you can see from the title, it's called Fallen Angel, a True Crime Fantasy. And a little backstory as to how it came about. I, I had, after we wrote, um, after I did Homicide is My Business, Jerry passed away and I, and I didn't want to stop writing. And Jerry and I did a lot of things together. And, um, and, and I, but I, what I had was, and if you were in my apartment, you would look to the left here and you would see boxes of, of my, uh, my, my files, so to speak, of things that I still have from the DA's office, not, not their files, but my work, my summation, so to speak. And I have, I have a lot of cases, a lot of stories that I did. I mean, I was in a DA's office for 30 years and I was a practicing attorney for, for 10 more. So I have a lot of, a lot of things to write. And, and I was going to do a book of short stories. And I went to my book, two book agents who had worked with me and I told them what I was planning on doing. And they said, Mike, it's not going to work. Uh, you can't do a book of short stories, true crime short stories. No one, no one buys that book. They want a whole, you know, beginning, middle and end kind of thing. So I said, okay. They said, if you can find a way to tie all these stories together, well, then you've got something. And I had this old idea, Bill, that, uh, that uh, for a TV show at one point, and Jerry and I had talked about it and, and, and it was a, I don't remember how it came about, but we, we decided that we were going to try to sell a story to Hollywood that was a, about a prosecutor who was recruited by a secret government organization to take on the greatest evil the world knows, and that's the devil, who had come to Brooklyn to, um, to do things uh, to unseat, I'm sorry, to, to upset the peace and stability of the borough, and, uh, and that he used Brooklyn, we used Brooklyn because that's where we were, but the idea was that he had done this across the across across the globe, and um, we wrote a proposal. And uh, and unfortunately, the proposal, as other things, uh, as we mentioned before, <laughs> kind of went nowhere. But the idea stuck to my stuck in my head, and I said, you know what? Let me give this a shot. And I wrote a book proposal with this as the way to tie all of these stories together. And my thought was that the cases that the devil was instigating. I would use I would use my cases as those cases, and um, and and in, and and insert this demon um, uh, who the idea is that he would do something to make sure that the people who committed these crimes, these horrific crimes, didn't see a day in, in jail and and were con and were were acquitted in each of these cases. So the idea is that the government couldn't allow this to happen. They recognized what was going on. They involved the Vatican or the Vatican actually recognized it first. The Vatican gets together with the government and they come up with this group headed by a former attorney general. And at the time, it the devil is in Brooklyn and things are, bad things are happening. And they recruit a prosecutor who coincidentally was the chief of the rackets division in the Brooklyn DA's office <laughs> to battle the devil. And uh, his name is Michael Gioca. And uh, and Gioca in Italian means gambler, and and you know that's what we how we wrote about him. He was a, a guy who took risks in trying cases and winning cases, and I was able to uh, to sell that idea to a publisher out here on Long Island, and um, and when she read the the proposal, she said, "Not only do I love it, my editors love it, and Mike, I want you to write this, but we want you to write three books." We don't think that you can just finish the story in one book. And she gave me a contract to write three of these stories, three of these books. And um, Fallen Angel is the first. And uh, and I've written now Fallen Angel book two, which will be out in September. And, I, and I'm at the computer. This is my desk in front of me right here. And I was at the computer actually beginning book three when it came time to, to plug into you and, uh, and, and do this. So... I, it has gotten very good, um, good reaction. First book. Um, the people who've read it have, have really liked it. And I'm telling you that there were people who were not my friends told me that. So it's not somebody just walking up to me and saying that, um, you know, uh, a friend of mine saying we love it. And I sold it to Hollywood. And the guy who, who, who my agent out in Hollywood gave it to a writer to, to, get involved with is loved it. I mean, he loved it. And he wrote, Billy wrote this pilot 
um, that when he read it to me and he was on a Zoom call just like this, read me the entire pilot, I have to tell you that the hair on the back of my neck stood up. That's you were how excited good. about it. <laughs> uh, I was really good. So, um, so the idea, the true crime fantasy is the case is a true crime. But the, the link and the tie together, the way they're tied together is the fantasy in terms of the battle of good versus evil, the prosecutor versus the devil. And um, and that's that's fallen angel. And, you know, I got I'm about to contact my publisher again when I when I tell her what I um, what I have in mind. I have so many stories. I could do a book four. I could do a book five. That's how how many I have. So we'll see if she's interested in it. And um you but know, Mike, was, there's, uh, such, there's such a huge audience for true crime. People can't get enough of this stuff. I and know. Thus, you know, you see podcasts. I know you've been on uh, Sammy the Bulls podcast a bunch of times recently. I have. And I have. Um, you can see there's so much interest. People just are mesmerized by stories about true crime, real crime. Uh, of course, gangsters, mobsters, they love yeah. that stuff. And uh, well, I, I don't think they can hear enough stories. No, I, I, I hope you're right, Bill. I hope you're right. But that's why I had to call it a true crime fantasy, because it's a novel. But I want true crime fans to know that the cases actually happen. So when you read about the death, of, I did a case involving the shooting of an off-duty police officer on on 4th of July. with his, He was with his girlfriend and he somebody came up to him and tried to rob his, his motorcycle from him. And um and it was a very interesting case and a very it, it was a case that, you know, kind of had this twist and turns. What I wrote about as the devil being the instigator of that particular crime, because that set this neighborhood and the city on fire because a cop was killed. Um, and that's the idea of what the devil is, is here in Brooklyn to do. Um, I want people to know that that case actually happened. I actually tried that case. And um and he, and it was, it's real. And it, um, you know, it, it's not something that I made up. Um, there are parts of it to fit the whole narrative of the devil that I had to kind of make up to, you know, to fit certain things, but the actual cases themselves are, are true. And, and it, that's why it's, I call it a true crime fantasy. So, um, you know, Mike, when you start writing, when you start writing these stories, these ideas, how long does it take you to, from start to finish, to start a book and finish a book when you have these ideas fresh in your mind? Well, when I have the idea fresh in my mind, the first thing I do is I go to my iPad and I go to the notes section and I write everything down that's in my head. Uh -huh. So, um, but it'll take, it takes, it's, it depends. It depends on, a, on several things. Um, basically what else I have to do. Um, but, um, but I would say I can knock out, Fallen Angel I, I knocked out in about four months. And, and while I was, that was being, um, while I was working on that, I had already in my head thought about what I was going to do for book two and had an outline, um, that I had for book two and book two took me a little bit longer because, um, there was, there was some things, you know, that happened, um, that I, that I, I couldn't predict, uh, in terms of, uh, my life and, uh, and took some time away from, from writing. Um, then we had the pandemic hit, you know, and, and things that you would have felt that that would have given you a lot, given me a lot more time, but quite frankly, it didn't. Um, it, it didn't, it, it, there were other things that I had to deal with at that point. So, but I would say that I could knock out one of these books in probably four or five months, maybe six months at the tops at tops. That's, and, um, that's pr pretty prolific. If you could write two to three books a year, that's unbelievable. Yeah. Yeah, well, I did uh, two. The two Crooked Brook, the two uh, Fallen Angel books will be within within a year's time. And keep in mind, Bill, I was all I was had written Hob Insiders by Business with Jerry at that point, um, and that was during the same calendar year as I began Fallen Angel, the first book. So, um, I, and you know what else I did, and I did the first time I've ever done this is the publisher wanted me to take Fallen Angel and make it an audio book. So I have now I now did that while I was recovering from my knee surgery, and uh, I, she sent me a microphone and a put me on put me onto a, uh, a a website that was a software website that I could record this, and um, and I did my first uh, book recording, which I thought was going to be a Mike, simple that, thing. That can't be easy because 
Whatever, it's not, Bill. Whatever the pressure is there to say a sentence without stuttering or doing something, you can't do it. <laughs> exactly. It, it was not easy. I was just about to took the words right out of my mouth. I thought it was going to be simple. It wasn't. It wasn't. Thank God. Thank God. She taught me with this software how to correct things. And if there was a mistake made, you could just simply stop, go back, erase it, and then start again. You know, so yeah. It, but it took me longer than I actually thought it would. And um, but it was fun. And and I'm I actually, you know, when I finished, I said, I'll never do this again. But then as I started to think about it, I said, you know what? Maybe I hope that she wants me to do book two as a, a an audio book too. Cause I I learned a lot. I learned how to do it now and and I'm and I'm okay with it. So well, what um, what's better for a reader than to have the author, the voice of the book? That's that's gotta be great. You know, Barbara yeah. Butcher, who I think you know. She has that book, yes. uh, what the what the dead know, and people love the book. And she also did the voice; she did the audio version. And people love to hear her read the book. And I'm sure with you too, they love that you're the voice of, the, of your own book. I hope so. I hope they do. I, I haven't gotten any reviews back yet from the publishers to whether or not I I screwed up uh, irreparably at this point. But um, but I, I I don't think I did. Uh, I made some mistakes. I admit that, but um, but and I would not do the the same. I would not do some things the same way a second time as I did the first time. Um, but uh, I, I'm looking forward to it. I hope that she asked me to do it because I'll, I'll do it in a heartbeat. So I think that's uh, great, folks. The books are Crooked Brooklyn, Friends of the Family, Homicide is My Business, and, and the latest book, Fallen Angel, all by former. Brooklyn District Attorney, Assistant District Attorney, Chief of the Rackets Bureau, Chief of the Homicide Bureau, Michael Vecchioni, as he embarks on his new prolific writing career. And what a what a great second career. I know, like cops, attorneys, sometimes they're burnt and they don't want to do that job anymore. And you want to yep. try something new, you know. And and this is this is what better than being a writer, and uh, uh, you know, talking about all the things you did during your lifetime. Thank you. I, I loved what I did, Bill. I loved what I did in terms of my work. And and when I left it, it was difficult. Uh, but this writing about it now has kind of put me back into where I was before in terms of being able to to think about the things that I that I did. And it uh, it it's been quite frankly, I don't want to overblow this, but it was I don't want to say a lifesaver, but it certainly allowed me to to do something other than sit around and and mope around and say, what am I going to do, you know, for, with my life? This has really kind of saved me. And I, I'm happy that I was able to do it. You know, Mike, it's an epiphany and it's also like therapy because you get yes. to talk about, and, and it really is. I think it's so, so many different art forms and writing is definitely an art form, especially when you're writing it. Hopefully it will be on the screen one day. It's just Thank like you. acting or stand up yeah, comedy, awesome. any of those things. It is like therapeutic in a way, yep. you know? But you know what else? What else is fun, Bill? Getting on shows like yours now and talking about these <laughs> things. It really, it really is. Yeah. You, you have no idea. I love doing these. I really do. And uh, I never turn them down. And, and I and I thank you. And uh, you know, and thank Phil for having me on. Uh, you know, uh, the 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 main uh, police off the cuff uh, podcast. And um, and uh, uh, it, it's 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 terrific. And and it, it another way of kind of reliving the things that I did that I love so much. 100%. And, and Mike, you've always been great on our shows and people love you as a guest because of the wealth of knowledge you bring to it. And they're like, oh, first of all, we owe people across the world always, we love your New York accent. Some 99% love you get like 1% think, what's with those accents? You guys sound horrible, you know, but most 99% exactly. of the people love our accents. And again, as I said, and we have a little twinge of the Long Island thing in there too, which people pick it out and I remember when I went to college at Buffalo State, my English lit teacher says, where are you from? I go, I'm from New York. No, no. He goes, you're not. Where are you from? I go, uh, Long Island. He goes, that's it. He goes, you guys have a bit of a different accent than New York. And he picked it out, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When I was in law school, this last one, I know you got to go. I just want to tell you this one quick story. When I was in law school, I had a partner of mine who we worked on cases together. We were partnered in this one particular course. And it had to do with trials. And um, and we did something. And at the end of the trial, the end of the, 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 the uh, semester, the, the teacher called us in and he said, look, you guys, terrific. And my buddy was from New York as well, from Brooklyn as well. 
And he said, but one thing I got to tell you guys, you got to lose those Brooklyn accents because yeah. nobody's going to hire you if they, if they, if you speak that way. So it was like eye opening. Wow. I didn't even know I had a Brooklyn accent. Yeah, so, right, right. Uh, but that was, um, you know, he made it, he made a very, very emphatic point about that, about changing, you know, the way that we speak so that we could make, you know, we could impress people who wanted to hire us as being our turn as being our clients. So. Um, yeah, good good but, luck with getting rid of the a uh, New York or a Brooklyn yeah, accent or a Long Island possibly, accent. I, I don't possibly. think it's going to happen. Anyway, this has been Police Off the Cuff, the Law and Crime series. We were privileged today to have retired Brooklyn district attorney, assistant district attorney, head of the Rackets Bureau, head of the Homicide Bureau, and just a, a prolific author of Fallen Angel, Homicide is My Business, Crooked Brooklyn, and I'm missing one. Which one am I missing now? Here we go. Friends of the family. The fam. Michael, Michael Vecchioni. And Mike, again, thank you so much for coming on the show. And we'll be in touch because I'm sure I'm going to call on you again. Thank you very much, Bill. Looking forward to it. Appreciate it. Have a, gr have a great day. One episode, just